So thanks so much to the LNO for pulling this off. It's been really fun and um, I'm happy to be part of it. So we took um, burning site news literally. And in the background here is a video playing of a prescribed burn that happened at the refuge last fall. It's one of the first ones ever to be started by drones dropping firebombs across the landscape. So that was pretty cool. And um, during the past year, we've received about 5 million in new funding that leverages our LTR. The um, most notable perhaps is the re-up to our REU site program led by Scott Collins. The focus of our current program is on understanding environmental variability, especially variability in climate, and how that will drive transitions among ecosystem states. It's a question that necessitates long-term data because each year only provides one data point. And it's particularly relevant for our ecosystems because um, variability has increased substantially over the past 100 years. So the, the first new approach that we're excited to share with you from the SEV involves the highly technical application of toothpicks. In the first photo are toothpicks onto which we've glued seeds of our two most dominant grassland species. And we're putting these out in different climate change experiments to get a better handle on the dynamics at the very earliest stages of ecosystem transition when plants are recruiting into the system. Graduate student Brooke Wainwright is, has been leading this. And the toothpicks are going into multiple experiments, but um, these include our signature experiment from our current proposal, which is called the mean variance experiment. And in this experiment, we're altering average climate. So the two rows here, making it 25% drier. And we're also altering the year-to-year -year variability in climate. So imposing a 50% increase or decrease in rainfall. And we do this by moving water between plots when it rains, which is the video that you're looking at here. These are data from the first year of this experiment in one of our grassland ecosystems. And in the top right, you can see under ambient conditions, these normal conditions are favoring the current dominant species at the site. But down here in the bottom right, if we make it 25% drier, and we also impose an extreme wet year, we're pushing the dominance toward favoring the future species that we think will dominate here. The um, second approach that I wanna tell you about, unlike the toothpicks, is actually pretty fancy. So we've been using a combination of stable isotope analysis from blood plasma, quantitative MRI, which images body fat in um, live animals, and standard old fashioned mark recapture trapping to understand mechanisms that underlie the complex dynamics we see in population abundances of our many rodent species. And I'm just showing you two example species here. Justin Yakel, co-PI Seth Newsom and collaborators build the first modeling framework to integrate these kinds of data on diet. And this stochastic dynamic program explores how plant composition, which varies wildly from year to year, influences consumer foraging decisions like which resources the consumer should select and when and how much they should store those resources in caches to buffer against high environmental variability. So the modeling work so far has helped to identify thresholds that are related to the ecological importance of environmental variability. And the first one is a threshold at 50 grams of, of mammal body size. So these are modeling results. And on the, along the y-axis, um, as you go down in the y-axis, variability becomes increasingly worse for the fitness of the animals. The 50 gram body size shows up, um, the threshold shows up in these red, orange, and yellow lines here, where basically these consumers have to maintain unrealistically high cash sizes in order to have non-zero fitness in a variable environment. So we predict from this model that these species should be much more sensitive to increasing variability than the large bodied con consumers that can um, store more fat. So that's the 50 gram rule. And then other analyses and syntheses of um, global data 
have been focusing on above ground net primary production. And here we get the 310 millimeter mean annual precipitation rule. This work has been led by Ichi Liu and postdoc Enqing Hu. Um, 310 millimeters is a key threshold. So sites that are drier than this threshold tend to benefit if you increase year to year variability in precipitation. And sites that are wetter than this threshold see declines in um, above ground net primary production when you increase climate variability. Ichi and Enching expanded the TECO ecosystem model to work for dry land sites. And then they've used it to project the future for global dry lands. And one um, interesting projection from this model is that as uh, we see global increases in variability and precipitation, we should actually see larger global carbon sinks in dry land ecosystems by year 2095. We're excited about opportunities to generalize results beyond our specific sites and ecosystems. And to get there, we have these three core modeling efforts. I've introduced you a little to the consumer model and the ecosystem model. The third modeling effort is a demographic model called WAVE. And it will bring in data like our toothpick recruitment data to predict plant invasion dynamics that drive ecosystem transitions. And just to give you an example of this, at the SEV, we have this very obvious transition from grassland to shrubland. This boundary has really not advanced in about 20 years, and it appears to be limited by recruitment. So Tom Miller's group um, planted shrub seedlings in, um, along this ecotone boundary and found that shrubs actually survive better if they're out in the grassland habitat. So this raises the question of whether increasing climate variability might cause pulses of the right constellation of climate factors that could um, increase shrub expansion into the future. And we'll be able to test this experimentally using our mean variance experiment. Other avenues that we've been pursuing to expand generalization involve cross-site collaboration. So building on the consumer theme, we've partnered with other Western sites to examine regional long-term changes in rodent abundance and diversity. And then we're also creating a network of sites, it's still very small, um, where there's a climate manipulation of year-to-year interannual variation in climate. Um, and I just returned from sabbatical in Argentina. And so with any luck, we may have a, a mean variance experiment there sometime in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. There is a question from Jesse before we move to the next block. I don't know if you can see it in the Q&A box. About, yeah, let me scroll down. Yeah. How does, so the question is, how does the variability small mammal relationship change as you compare grassland small mammal species versus PJ forest small mammal species? So the um, small mammals that dominate in the PJ forest are smaller. They're, they're less abundant, sort of the large bodied kangaroo rats that cache. We haven't explored this directly with the model yet, but um, my prediction would be that it changes because of what species dominate those two sites. Thanks so much.